Hello, I'm Rosie Pursuit, and today I'm reading the sixth part of Twelve Degrees of Humility and Pride by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Chapter 11 Second Degree Levity of Mind The Opposite of the Eleventh Degree of Humility Short and Sensible Speech in a Subdued Tone For the monk who is careless about himself and unduly inquisitive about other people, looks up to some as his betters, looks down upon others as his inferiors. In some, he sees cause for envy, while others are the objects of his scorn. It thus happens that his mind, innovated by his habit of staring about him, is oppressed by no anxiety on its own account, now through pride soars to the heights, and then sinks through envy to the depths. He shows at one moment a sulky acquiescence in his own wickedness, at another a childish delight in his excellence. In the former he exhibits his weakness, in the latter his vanity. In both his pride, for it is love of his own excellence that gives him distress when others surpass him, and joy when he surpasses them. This unbalanced disposition shows itself in speech, sometimes brief and bitter, sometimes full and feeble. Alternately, jocose and doleful and always silly. Compare, if you please, these two earliest degrees of pride the two highest degrees of humility, and see if the last one of these latter does not repress curiosity, the one before it levity, you will find the same contrast if the other degrees are similarly compared. But now, let's go on to the study of the third degree without however falling into it. Chapter 12 The Third Degree unseasonable merriment, the opposite of the tenth degree of humility, refraining from frequent and light laughter. It is characteristic of the proud that they always look out for pleasures and shun sadness. In accordance with the saying, the heart of fools is where there is mirth. So it is that the monk who has already descended two degrees of pride and through inquisitiveness has arrived at levity, will see the joy for which he is always on the lookout, constantly interrupted by the distress, which he feels at the sight of good in others, chafes under the sense of humiliation, and takes refuge in a suggestion of unreal comfort. Henceforth, he restrains his inquisitiveness on that side on which his own worthlessness and his neighbor's excellence are shown to him, and turns his whole attention to the other side. He may thus mark only too carefully those things in which he seems to be the better man, and may hide those in which others surpass him, and so may put away all thought of sorrow and remain always merry. It thus happens that silly merriment soon go gains sole possession of the man whom joy and sorrow alternately claim. I set this before you as the third degree of pride. Now, note the marks by which you may detect it, either in yourself or in anyone else. You seldom or never heal a man of this kind groan or see him shed tears. You will think, if you consider that his faults are either forgotten or forgiven, his gestures are those of a buffoon, he looks that of a coxcomb, his step that of a dandy, he is always making jokes and never loses a chance of laughing. He cuts out of his mind all discreditable he cuts out of his mind all discreditable and therefore distressing recollections, 
and concentrates his mental vision on his real or pretended merits. As he thinks of nothing but what is pleasant without considering whether it is lawful, he can neither restrain laughter nor hide his unseasonable merriment. A bladder swells when it is full of wind, but if a small hole is pricked in it and it is squeezed, it creaks as it collapses. And the air does not rush out at once, but is gradually expelled and gives out frequent intermittent sounds. And like Mano, when a monk has filled his mind with vapid and vulgar thoughts, the flood of folly which cannot, owing to the rule of silence, find full and free vent, is thrown but his narrow jaws and guffaws of laughter. He constantly hides his face as if ashamed, compresses his lips, and clenches his teeth. He laughs loudly without meaning to do so, and even against his will, and when he has stopped his mouth with his fists, he is frequently heard to sneeze. Chapter 13 The Fourth Degree Boastfulness the opposite of the ninth degree of humility, reticence until questioned. But when vanity increases and the bladder begins to be inflated, it becomes necessary to loosen the belt and allow a larger outlet for the air, otherwise the bladder will burst. So the monk who is unable to discharge his superabundant store of unseemly merriment by laughter or by gesture breaks forth with winds, with the words of Elihu, my belly is as a new wine, which wanteth vent, but which bursteth the new vessels. He must speak out, or break down, for he is full of, of matter to speak of, and the spirit of his bowels constraineth him. He hungers in thirsts for hearers, at whom he may throw his banalities, to whom he may pour out his feelings, and let them know what a fine fellow he is. But when he has found his opportunity of speaking, if the conversation turns on literary matters, old and new points are brought forward, he airs his ideas in loud and lofty tone. He interrupts his questioner and answers before he is asked. He puts he himself puts the question and gives the answer, nor does he even allow the person to whom he is talking to finish his remarks. When the striking of the silence gong puts a stop to conversation, he complains that a full hour is not a sufficient allowance and asks for indulgence that he may go on with his gossip after the time for it is over, not to add to the knowledge of anyone else, but to boast of his own. He has the power, but not the purpose of giving useful information. His care is not to teach you or to learn from you things which he does not know, but that the extent of his learning may be made known. If the subject under discussion is religion, he is forward with his vision and his dreams. He upholds fasting, prescribes vigils, and maintains the paramount importance of prayer. He enlarges at great length, but with excessive conceit on patience, humility, and all the virtues in turn, with the intention that you on hearing him should say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak, that a good man out of his good treasure, bringing forth good things. If the talk's tone on light subjects becomes more loquacious because he is on more familiar ground. If you heal the taunt of his conceit, you may say that his mouth is a fount of such buffoonery as to move even strict and sober monks to light laughter. To put it shortly, 
Mark his waggle and his chattel, and this you have the name and description of the fourth degree of pride. Remember the description and avoid the reality. With this warning, go on to the fifth degree, which I call eccentricity. Chapter 14 The Fifth Degree Eccentricity The Opposite of the Eighth Degree of Humility Observance of the General Rule of the Monastery A man who prides himself on being better than his fellow men thinks it is a disgrace if he does not do something more than they do, whereby his superiority may be apparent. Therefore, the general rule of the monastery and the example of its senior members are not enough for him. Yet, his anxiety is not to be, but to be seen to be better than they. His effort is not to lead a better life, but visibly to surpass others, so that he may be able to say, I am not as the rest of men. He takes more credit to himself for having once gone without a meal while others were having theirs than he does in having shared in a fast of seven days. One little private prayer of his own seems to him more commendable than the recitation of all the psalms set for an entire night. At mealtime, he has a habit of casting his eyes all around the tables, and if he sees anyone eating less than himself, he is annoyed at being outdone. He begins severely to cut down the amount of food which he has hitherto recognized as a necessary ration, because he is more afraid of loss of credit than of the pangs of hunger. If he catches sight of anyone more shrunken and sallow than himself, he cannot rest under what he considers to be a disgrace, and since he cannot see his own face and the aspect under which he presents himself to onlookers, he examines his hands and arms, which he can see, beats his breast, taps his shoulders and loins, and from the more or less attenuated condition of his limbs, forms an opinion as to the paleness or color of his face. But while active in all his private devotions, he is indolent in public worship. He keeps vigil. While in bed and goes to sleep in his stall, he sleeps all night while others are chanting the holy psalms. While the vigil is over, the other monks are resting in the cloister. He alone lingers in the oratory. He coughs and spits the ears of those sitting outside are filled with sighs and groans from his corner. By his silly and singular action, he has established a high reputation with his more simple brethren, who quite approve what they see of his doings, though they do not detect their motive, and by the commendation which they bestow on him, they aid and abet the wretched man's mistake. I'd like to say, St. Bernard goes hard, and this is specific toward, to monks, but there is a degree that we may learn from this. This happens a lot in everyday life. You know, if everybody does something that's, let's say, hard work, and you do this tiny little thing, this tiny little extra thing, you can feel real chuffed up about yourself like, man, I did more than everyone else. It's something to think about. Chapter 15 The Sixth Degree Conceit The opposite of the seventh degree of humility, belief and acknowledgement of one's inferiority to others. He believes what he hears, praises his own action, and pays no attention to the motive he welcomes a favorable opinion and forgets its purpose. And he who in everything else puts more trust in himself than in other men, attaches more weight to the opinions of others about him than to his own. So not only does he think that he exhibits superior religion on his account of his verbal profession or special display of piety, 
but in his inmost heart, he considers himself more holy than anyone else, and if he knows that he is praised for anything, he ascribes it not to the ignorance or the kindliness of the person who commends him, but with much conceit to his own deserts. So after eccentricity, conceit has made good its claim to the sixth degree. After it, audacity shows itself. And in it, the seventh degree consists. Chapter 16 The seventh degree, audacity. The opposite of the sixth degree of humility, acknowledgement of oneself as unworthy and useless. For well, if a man thinks himself superior to others, it is likely that he will not push himself in front of them. He is the first to take a seat at meetings, the first to intervene in debate. He comes forward without invitation and with no introduction but his own. He reopens questions that have been settled and goes again over work that has been done. He considers that nothing that he has not himself designed and carried out has been properly organized or satisfactorily executed. He criticizes those who sit in judgment and tells them what their decisions should be. If, when the time comes for the appointment of a prior, he is not promoted to the office, he is certain that his abbot is either jealous or mistaken. But if some less important duty is assigned to him, he is displeased and contemptuous, for if he feels himself qualified for greater work, he thinks he ought not to be employed in smaller matters. But it is inconceivable that a man who, with more rashness than readiness, is very anxious to undertake all sorts of work, should not sometimes make mistakes, and it is the duty of the abbot to approve such a one for his error. But how will he confess his fault if he, thi if he neither thinks himself nor will allow others to think him worthy of censor. Therefore, when his fault is pointed out to him, it is not removed but grows worse. So if, when he is reproved, you see him incline his heart to wicked words, you may know that he is, has sunk to the eighth degree, which is called defense of wrongdoing. Chapter 17 The Eighth Degree Defense of Wrongdoing The opposite of the fifth degree of humility, a humble and straightforward disclosure of sins and evil thoughts. There are many ways in which defense is made for sin. Man either says, I did it not, or I no doubt did it, but he acted rightly in doing so, or I may have acted wrongly but not to a serious extent, or, oh, if I was seriously wrong, I had no bad intention. If, however, he, like Adam and Eve, is proved to be guilty, he attempts to excuse himself on the ground that he was tempted by someone else. But if a man unblushingly defends even open sins, will he ever humbly disclose to the abbot the hidden evil thoughts which come into his mind? Do we? That's more to think about. Do we ever? Are we ever willing to disclose the evil thoughts that come to our minds? Perhaps with the priest or with the parent? Someone whose job is to guide us to being better. Again. It's difficult. I do recommend the Sacrament of Reconciliation. It's quite nice going to it. Chapter 18 The Ninth Degree Dishonest Confession The opposite of the fourth degree of humility, willing endurance of hardship as a matter of obedience. With that said, dishonest Reconciliation is not very good. Let us continue. 
But although defenses of this kind are considered so wrong that they are called by the prophet evil words, a false and perverse confession is much more dangerous than even a brazen and stubborn defense. For there are the some who, when they are reproved for their rather conspicuous offenses, and to know that no excuse which they may offer will be accepted, have recourse to a much more cunning form of defense, they reply by a deceitful confession. For there is, as it is written, one that humbleth himself wickedly, and his interior is full of deceit. The countenance is downcast, downcast, the body is prostrate. They exact from themselves, if they are able to do so, some tears. They interrupt their speech by sighs and intersperse their words with groans. A man of this description not only offers no excuse for the offenses with which he is charged, but it himself even exaggerates his guilt. He does this that you, when you hear him, make a further accusation against himself of some impossible or inconceivable crime may be disposed to disbelieve even that of which you thought him guilty, and thus, from the fact that he makes a confession which you fully believe to be false, some doubt may be thrown on that which you held to be almost certain, and when these men make a statement, the acceptance of which they do not desire, by their confession they excuse, and by their disclosures they conceal their fault. Their confession sounds praiseworthy in the mouth, but wickedness is hidden in their heart. So that he who hears may think that the confession is made with more humility than accuracy, and may apply to them the scriptural saying, The righteous man at the beginning of his speech is his own accuser. For in the sight of men, they would rather be thought in wanting in truthfulness than in humility, when in the sight of God they are lacking in both. But if their guilt is so clear that by no subterfuge can it be entirely concealed, they nevertheless adopt the tone, though not the spirit of repentance, and by this means remove the mark, though not the reality of their guilt, as they make up for ignoring an open offense by the credit of a public confession. A fine sort of humility is this, in which pride seeks to array itself, that it may not lose caste. But this double dealing is soon detected by the abbot, unless he is to some extent imposed upon by this haughtily humility, and thus induced to pass over the fault or postpone the penalty. The furnace trieth the potter's vessel, and distress reveals the real penitent. For the man who is truly penitent does not shrink from the trouble of repentance. Whatever is prescribed to him on account of the fault which he detests, he accepts with submissive and silent acquiescence. And if, through this obedience, unexpected hardships arise, and he thereby sustains injuries that were not intended. He does not give up, so that lie may show that lie has his place in the fourth degree of humility. But he whose confession is unreal, when he is confronted with a slight rebuke or trifling penalty, is unable to either feign humility or to conceal his dissimulation. He murmurs, gnashes his teeth, and loses his temple, and it becomes clear that, so far from standing in the fourth degree of humility, he has fallen into the ninth degree of pride, which from the above description of it may well be called sham confession. How great, think you, must be the proud man's consternation when his deceit is detected his pardon forfeited, and his fault not condoned. He is at last found out and condemned 
by all, and the general indignation is all the greater when men see how erroneous was their former judgment of him. It is then the duty of the abbot to be less ready to pardon him, because the forgiveness of one would be an offense to all. The tenth degree, rebellion, the opposite of the third degree of humility, obedient submission to superiors. Unless, by a merciful intervention of providence, this man quietly accepts the unanimous verdict, a thing which it is very difficult for such persons to do. He soon becomes shameless and defiant and more hopelessly degenerate, and sinks through rebellion into the tenth degree, so that he, he who had hitherto by his conceit treated his brethren with veiled discourtesy, now, by his disobedience, shows open contempt for authority, for it should be observed that all the degrees which I have divided into twelve may be arranged in three groups. In the first six, there is disrespect to his brethren, and the four that follow defiance of authority, while the two last, while the last two show complete contempt for God. And it should also be noted that, just as the first two degrees in the ascending scale of humility must be attained before entering the community, so the last downfall steps in pride, which are their counterpart, cannot be taken whilst in it, that the first two degrees must be previously passed, the language of the rule makes clear, for it says that the third degree is that any one for love of God should submit with entire obedience to his superior. Therefore, if this submission, which beyond doubt is made, when the novice enters the convent, is assigned to the third degree, the necessary presumption is that the two preceding degrees have been passed. Therefore, when a monk scorns alike the harmony of the brethren, the decision of his ruler, what more can he do in the monastery except cause scandal? Chapter 20 The eleventh degree, freedom to sin, the opposite of the second degree of humility, forbearance to press personal desire. So after the tenth degree, which has been prescribed as rebellion, the man is at once caught in the eleventh. He then enters those paths which are attractive to men, at the end of which, unless God shall perchance have interposed some barrier for his protection, he will be plunged into the nethermost hell, that is, into contempt of God. For the wicked man, when he is come into the depths of evils, contemneth. The eleventh degree may be called freedom to sin, since in it a monk who sees that he has now neither a ruler to feel nor brethren to respect can safely and freely give full play to his own desires, which shame as well as fear prevented him from doing while in the monastery. But although he no longer dreads his brethren or his abbot, he has not yet lost all awe of God. Reason, some faint echo of which still remains, places this check upon his inclination, and it is not without some hesitation that he enters into his sinful course, and, like a man who is trying to ford a stream, steps rather than runs into the torrent of vice. The Twelfth Degree Habitual Sin the opposite of the first degree of humility, constant abstinence from sin for fear of God. But when, by the awful judgment of God, his first offenses have been unpunished, the pleasure that he has derived from them is freely repeated, and its repetition engrosses him, lust is quickened, reason lulled, and habit becomes bondage. The wretched man is drawn into the abyss of evil, made prisoner to his despotic rule of vice, 
and so overwhelmed by the whirlpool of his carnal desires that he forgets alike his own reason and the fear of God, and says madly in his heart, there is no God. He now, without scruple, puts pleasure in the place of law. His mind, his hands, and his feet are no longer forbidden to consider, execute, and pursue courses that are unlawful. But whatever comes to his heart, his mouth, or his hands, he designs, discusses, and carries out with evil intent, idle utterance, and sinful action. Just as a righteous man, when he has risen through all the degrees, is able, by his habitual goodness, to run eagerly and easily to life, so does the wicked man, who has gone down through the same degrees, in consequence of his evil practice, emancipated from the rule of reason and unrestrained by the bridle of fear, hasten undaunted to his death. There are all, some in the middle, who are wearied and worried, who alternately tortured by the fear of hell and hindered by long-standing habit, find the descent or ascent hard work. The first one and the last one alone move quickly and without hindrance. The latter hastens to death, the former to life, the one who more speedily, the other with greater care. Love makes one ego, lust renders the other inert. The affection of one, the indifference of the other, makes both insensible to toil. So in the one perfect love, in the other consummate wickedness drives out fear. Loyalty gives confidence to the one, blindness does the same for the other. So the, the twelfth degree may be called the habit of sinning, because in it, the fear of God is lost, and its place is taken by scorn. Chapter 22 To what extent may prayer be offered for the incorrigible and spiritually dead? For such a one, says John the Apostle, I do not say that anyone shall pray, but sayest thou, O Apostle, that no one may have hope? Surely, he who loves that man may groan. He ventures not to pray. He need not forbear to weep. What is this that I say, that perchance there remains the, the resource of hope where prayer has no place? Take an instant of one who believes and hopes. It is not pray. Lord, she says, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. What mighty faith to believe that, by his presence, the Lord could have prevented death. But what comes next? Is it inconceivable that she should doubt that he whom the believe, he whom she believed could have kept him alive was unable to raise him from the dead? But now, she says, this, I know that whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give to thee. Then, when he asks where they had laid him, she replies, Come and see. Why dost thou step there, O Martha? Thou dost afford to us ample evidence of thy faith, but as it is so great, why dost thou hesitate? Come, sayest thou, and see. Why, if thou art not without hope, dost not thou go further and say, and raise him up? If on the other hand, thou art in despair, why givest thou the master unreasonable trouble? Is it perchance that faith sometimes obtains that for which we dare not pray? Then, as he approaches the corpse, thou dost object to his coming kneel, and sayest, Lord, by this time he sinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Was this said in despair, or in pretense? In somewhat the same sense, the Lord himself, after his resurrection, made as though he would go further, 
while his intention was to remain with the disciples. O ye holy women, intimate friends of Christ, if ye love your brother, why do ye not appeal to the compassion of him, of whose power and pity ye cannot entertain a doubt? Their answer is, we pray all the better for not uttering a prayer. We trust the more completely for concealing our confidence. We show our faith and suppress our feelings. He who has no need for any information himself knows what we desire. We indeed know that he can do all things, but a miracle so great, so unprecedented, though it is within his power, far surpasses anything that in our insignificance we deserve. It is enough for us to have afforded scope for his power and an opportunity for his pity, and we prefer patiently to await his will than daringly to demand that which it may not be his pleasure to give. And finally, our modesty may perhaps obtain for us something more than we deserve. And I observe that Peter wept after his serious fall, but I do not hear that he prayed, yet I have no doubt about his pardon. Learn further from the mother of the Lord how to have full faith in the marvelous and in the fullness of faith to preserve modesty. Learn to adorn faith with modesty and to adorn presump- and to avoid presumption. They have no wine, she says. With what brevity, with what reverence, she made a suggestion on a matter in which she felt a kindly anxiety that you may learn in a similar circumstance rather to have a sympathetic sigh than to venture to make a direct request. She concealed her eager earnestness under a shade of shyness and modestly refrained from expressing the confidence she felt in prayer. She did not come boldly forward with a clear request and say straight out before everyone, I appeal to thee, my son. The wine has run short, the guests are annoyed, the bridegroom is dismayed. Show what thou canst do. But although, as her breast was burning with these and many other thoughts, she might have expressed her feelings warmly, yet the devout mother quietly approached her mighty son, not to test his power, but to discover his will. They have no wine, she says. How could she better have combined modesty and confidence. There was no lack of faith in her devotedness, of seriousness in her voice, or earnestness in her desire. She, however, though she was his mother, waived the claims of kinship and did not venture to ask for a miraculous supply of wine. With what face, then, can I, a common slave to whom it is a high honor to be in service, at once of the son and of the mother, presume to ask for the life of one who has been dead for four days. It is also recorded in the gospel that two blind men had sight given or restored to them, one the sight which he had lost, the other which he had never possessed, for one had become blind, the other had been so born. But the one who had lost his sight earned marvelous mercy by piteous and persistent prayer, while the other, while the one who was born blind received from his divine enlightener yet more merciful and more marvelous benefit without any previous petition from himself. To him it was afterwards said, Thy faith hath made thee whole. I also read of the raising of two persons who had lately died, and of the third one, who had been dead for days. But only the one who was still lying in her father's house was thus raised at his prayer. The other two were restored by a great and unexpected manifestation of mercy. So if 
in like manner it should happen, which may God avert, that by any one of our brethren should meet not bodily but spiritual death, as long as he shall be with us. I, sinner that I am, will persistently assail the Savior with my prayers, and with those of the brethren, if he revives, we shall have gained our brother, but if we do not deserve to be heeded, and the time comes when he cannot endure those who are alive or be endured by them, but must be carried out for burial, I go on faithfully with my mourning. Though I cannot pray with so much confidence, I dare not say openly, Lord, raise up our dead brother, but with anxious heart and inward trembling, I cease not to cry out, if by any chance at all the Lord shall listen to the desire of the poor, his ear will heed the readiness of their hearts. And there is that saying, Wilt thou show wonders to the dead, or shall physicians raise to life and give praise to thee, and concerning him who has been dead for days? Shall any one in the sepulchre Shall anyone in sepulchral declare thy mercy and thy truth in destruction? Meanwhile, it is possible that the Savior may be pleased to meet us unforeseen and unexpectedly, and moved by the tears, not by try prayers of the bearers, to restore the dead man to those who live, or actually to recall from among the dead one who is already buried. But I should describe as dead the man who is, who by excusing his sins has already come down to the eighth degree. For praise perisheth from the dead as from one does not exist. But after the tenth degree, which is third from the eighth, he is already being carried out into the library to sin. When he is expelled from the monastic community, but after he has passed the fourth degree, he is rightly said to be four days dead. And when he falls into the fifth degree of habitual sin, he is already buried. But God forbid that we should cease to pray in our hearts, for such even as these, that we do not venture to do so openly, as Paul also mourned for those whom he knew to have died impenitent. For although they shut themselves out from our united prayers, they cannot altogether do so from their effects. They should nevertheless realize the great danger which those incur, whom the church, which prays confidently for the Jews, heretics, and heathen, dares not to mention in her worship. For when, on Good Friday, prayer is expressly offered for certain wicked persons, no mention is made of those who are excommunicated. You may, perhaps, say Brother Godfrey, that in thus describing the degrees of pride instead of those hum of humility, I seem to have gone beyond your request and my own tardy promise, to which my answer is that I was unable to teach anything but what I had learned. I did not think it seemly on my part to speak of an assent, since I am aware that my own movements have been in a downward rather than in an upward direction. Blessed Benedict may set before you the degrees of humility, for he has previously set his own heart upon them. I have nothing to put before you unless it be my own downward course. Yet, if that is carefully examined, the way to go up may happily be found therein. For if, as you are going towards Rome, a man who is coming thence meets you, you ask him the way how can he better tell you than, be, than by pointing out the route that he has followed, and naming the castles, 
villages, cities, rivers, and mountains, which he has passed, records his own journey and foretells yours. So that, as you go on, you may recognize the places that he has passed. In like manner, in this downward course of mine, you may possibly discover the upward steps. And as you ascend, may you study them to more purpose in your heart than in my book. Okay. I I think St. Bernard doesn't give him, himself enough credit. <laughs> Perhaps he did have a, some sort of downward course, but we do know him to be holy. It's interesting to think that a saint who was at a point of time writing a book on humility and pride believed himself in a downward descent into pride. It is, it gives you something, something to think about. I know oftentimes in our modern era, we have it, issues with confidence. I'd like to speak on this. And I don't know if I can actually give you good advice, but I believe that there's a difference between confidence and Let's see. Confidence and pride. There is a difference, though it is subtle and extremely difficult to find. Confidence can be defined as knowledge of one's ability to do something. While pride can be not necessarily in an overestimation, but rather... Let's use levity. We spoke on levity today. A levity in such confidence. While also possibly being an overestimation. It is important to note that we must know what we are capable of so that we may use our talents and abilities and usefulness to produce that of which is good, to do that of which is good. It is within our own brokenness that, that it may be, it may allow us to come closer to God, but we must remember that in doing so, it is a mere reflection of God. It's something that God has given us, that our goodness exists for the goodness of God, and that truly, we are broken. I don't believe I put it into the best possible words, but I think I gave something to think about. Alright, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoyed the book, there's a link to the playlist in the description below. You know, this is a problem with reading from scripts. Uh, you've already finished it at this point. Uh, yeah, if you enjoyed the book, make sure to subscribe so you can read the next book, or listen to the next book as it will. <laughs> that is all, and may God bless.